Okay, so um, our first speaker today will be Dr. Sunil Amin, a director of endoscopy at Jackson Memorial Hospital and the Leonard Foundation Medical Center, director of endo endoscopic oncology and assistant professor of clinical medicine in the division of gastroenterology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Amin received his Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University, where he graduated cum laude. He then attended medical school at Columbia University, where he obtained both his MD and MPH degrees. After graduating medical school, Dr. Amin completed his residency training in internal medicine, and then subsequently his fellowship training in gastroenterology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He completed further subspecialty training in interventional endoscopy at Columbia University. He has done extensive research and has many publications and topics ranging from pancreatic adenocarcinoma to some of his most recent work dealing with digestive manifestations in COVID-19 patients and how COVID-19 has impacted gastroenterology training. He recently received the 2020 American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy International Endoscopic Training Award. Today, he will be presenting on third space endoscopy. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Sunil Amin. Thank you uh, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm happy to talk to everyone today about a topic that I think is very exciting. Uh, it's called third space endoscopy, and um, it's new and upcoming in gastroenterology and really starting to blur the lines between what is a therapeutic endoscopist and minimally invasive surgeon. So, um, hopefully over the next 20 or 25 minutes, um, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding of what this is. So the learning objectives of the talk today are to define, first off, what is meant by third space endoscopy, to understand the clinical indications and utility of third space endoscopy procedures. Uh, we use the acronym POEM and GPOEM, which you'll become familiar with over the next few minutes, and as well as to be able to discuss these procedures with patients, medical and surgical colleagues, uh, and refer to GI when appropriate. So to begin talking about third space endoscopy, I need to define for you the first and the second space. So um, I'll show you some endoscopic images here. On the left side of the screen, you see, uh, this is an endoscopic image of the esophagus. It's, it's a normal looking esophagus, a tubular structure, and there's healthy mucosa all around. And this is what we like to see. Uh, on the right side of the screen, you can clearly see a defect here in the esophagus, and that's a perforation, and, and this down here is the mediastinal fat. So the first space is the esophageal lumen, or the GI lumen, and the second space is actually outside of the esophageal wall, or outside of the GI tract, in, in the peritoneal cavity or the mediastinum, depending on where you are, that's the second space, and that's somewhere where we uh, try our best to avoid at all costs because that has all sorts of negative implications for our patients. So taking this a little further, um, here's a schematic of the GI tract. And as I mentioned, the first space is the esophageal lumen, so that's right in the middle. The second space is outside of the GI wall. Um, and then what the third space is, is actually the layers of the wall of the GI tract. So that's this area right here. So the layers of the esophageal wall or the GI tract wall are the uh, mucosa first, the submucosa, the um, muscle layer, the circular and longitudinal muscle layer, we call that the muscularis propria, and then the serosa, which is the outermost layer. So over the last 10 years or so, gastroenterologists have learned how to utilize this third space to perform some new and effective interventions for our patients um, in a safe way without the risk of perforation that would come um, with simply exposing the peritoneal cavity to the GI lumen and the risk of contamination that comes with that. So the, the procedures I'll talk to you about today are it's called a POEM procedure and a G-POEM procedure, and these are procedures that I was fortunate to learn um, when I was actually in Prague in October, November, which was a strange time to go, but the only time that worked for me personally. And I was lucky enough to learn some of these procedures with um, a master endoscopist out there as part of the endoscopic training award I received um, through our national society. So I think it's best to kind of explain to you these procedures 
from a disease specific standpoint. So we'll start off with achalasia and um, then we'll talk about gastroparesis. And these are the two disease processes that um, the procedures are, are, are kind of revolve around. And I think they're both uh, diseases that all internists, regardless of the specialty, uh, do come across a good amount. So the third space endoscopy procedure for achalasia, which I'll discuss with you in detail next, is called the peroral endoscopic myotomy or poem procedure. And for gastroparesis, it's called the gastric peroral endoscopic myotomy or g -pulm. And they're really fundamentally built around the same concept. And hopefully, um, I'll be able to explain that to you in a digestible manner over the next few minutes. So to begin, we'll just run through achalasia. As many of you know, it's a esophageal motility disorder. Patients present with dysphagia to both solids and liquids. They feel like food is being stuck in their throat. And from a pathophysiologic standpoint, it's due to increased pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, over here, you can see this is a lower esophageal sphincter where the esophagus meets the stomach and it's, it's very tight and can't relax when you swallow. In addition, the esophageal body generally loses peristaltic function and the combination of these two processes leads to the clinical symptoms of dysphagia. So achalasia is a very bothersome disease that um, results in a lot of patient discomfort and um, is uh, something that, that we are now able to treat very quickly and effectively with, with one of these new procedures. So, we diagnose it with something called high-resolution esophageal manometry. There's three types of achalasia, and in the center of the screen, I have the esophageal manometry image for a classic type one achalasia. Um, and the way we read these are, the top here is the upper esophageal sphincter, the bottom is the lower esophageal sphincter, and the middle is the esophageal body. And basically what I'm showing you is a picture where there's no peristalsis in the esophageal body, so there's no ability to propel a bolus of food down and in addition the lower esophageal sphincter is elevated and it doesn't relax when you try to swallow. Um, so that's type 1 classic achalasia. Type 2 very quickly is a panesophageal pressurization uh, and type 3 is what we call a spastic achalasia but the hallmark of all three types of achalasia is that the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't relax and that is what we use to focus on the, the poem procedure around the fact that the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't relax. This is a classic image of a barium esophagram, which some of you may remember from medical school or studying for internal medicine exams. Um, it's a classic bird's beak esophagus, is what we see with achalasia. You see a, a dilated esophagus that tapers into what we call a bird's beak, and um, we don't generally use this to diagnose achalasia in the United States anymore, but it's it's a, it's a powerful image that most people remember. So in terms of how we treat achalasia, traditionally we had four things we could use. Um, medical therapy, we could give calcium channel blockers, nitrates, in um, an effort to reduce the, uh, the pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter to relax it. It never really works very well, not a very durable treatment. For older patients, we sometimes give Botox injection into the lower esophageal sphincter to relax it and allow food to pass. Um, it works okay, but you know, usually patients require another injection within, you know, I would say six to twelve months, maybe even earlier than that. Pneumatic dilation is where we take a really large balloon dilator and we perform an endoscopy and we just kind of stretch the muscle of the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and then Heller's myotomy, which is a surgical procedure that requires everything that comes with surgery is done in the operating room and uh, patients are subject to the recovery that is associated with that. So th those are traditional ways we could treat achalasia and, and none of them were very satisfying apart from the Heller's, but like I said, it is an actual surgery. So in 2011, there was a landmark paper published in our field in the New England Journal, which looked at pneumatic dilation, which was our best endoscopic option versus Heller's myotomy. And it found that um, among 201 patients randomized to either a 
laparoscopic hellers or pneumatic dilation. There was no difference in two years between the two groups. In addition, um, not only in uh, lower esophageal sphincter pressure, but also esophageal emptying quality of life. Around the same time as this paper was coming out, this gentleman, Haru Inoue, um, who really is the father of third space endoscopy, was coming up with this procedure called the POEM procedure in Northern Yokohama Hospital in Japan. And that's where we'll switch gears at this point so I can explain to you exactly what that is. Um, so building on the same concepts and the same idea that we want to somehow reduce the pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter, which we think is the main issue with patients that have achalasia. Um, the POEM procedure allows us to work within the wall of the esophagus. As I mentioned, that is the third space and essentially cut the muscle of the lower esophageal sphincter like you would do with the Heller's myotomy, but all through an endoscopy that takes about an hour. So I'll show you the image on the left side of the screen. This is from Dr. Inouye's original paper. Uh, shows the endoscope actually starting to enter into the wall of the esophagus. So that's it right there, and we call it the submucosa. Uh, on the second image, it's kind of created a tunnel all the way below the lower esophageal sphincter into the stomach. And in the third image, it's starting to cut the muscle uh, above the lower esophageal sphincter. And this is taken all the way down below the lower esophageal sphincter, what we call a myotomy or a cut of the muscle. Finally, at the end of the procedure, the area that we, the, the um, defect that we caused in the mucosa or the lining of the esophagus is simply closed with clips and it looks like apart from the clips that nothing ever really happened. So this is what it looks like. These are some actual endoscopic images of this procedure. On the um, top left, you see the muscle layer, which is those white strands. That's the circular muscle. And then you see a beautiful blue hue, which is actually the submucosa dyed with indigo carmine. Uh, to allow us to kind of keep our orientation and know which layer is which. Um, B is what the technique looks like when you get down to the stomach, when you've created this tunnel all the way into the stomach. And C is actually, you see a knife cutting the muscle layer, which is the, the myotomy. In D, the myotomy is complete. And in E, these are just the clips. And this, so this is all you end up seeing from the the mucosa side. So all, all of these images, A, B, C, and D, are actually within the wall of the esophagus. And like I said, it can all be done just with the regular endoscopy and the endoscopy suite, and it takes about an hour. So how, how good is this procedure? What is the efficacy? Well, you know, we've now done several thousand cases around the world. Like I said, it's been around for 10 years, and it's moving to much more uh, it's becoming more widely available. So before it was really just available in specialized centers. There were only a couple places in the U.S. that were able to offer it, but now it's really becoming standard of care of most academic medical centers. Um, the largest series of 1,300 patients from Japan um, has very high efficacy, well over 90%, as do the other series. Um, we have a series of 300 patients from Hopkins, 220 from India, and they're all generally um, high 80s, low 90s, sometimes even higher in terms of treatment success. The Eckert score uh, significantly improved pre and post, and that's a measure of um, quality of life and esophageal quality of life and dysphagia. And um, complication rates are very low. Um, some of these are, very, are varied in what they consider complication. The most common complication of this procedure is um, a type of, uh, pneumo or capnoperitoneum, where some air leaks into the mediastinum or, or into the uh, peritoneal cavity, and that just dissolves within an hour or so, and the patients generally um, have no long-term effects from that. But sometimes it's called, it's, we consider a complication because they do require a little bit of a needle decompression temporarily. Um, so this uh, is a paper that came out last year, again in New England Journal, and this time, instead of comparing the Heller's myotomy procedure to the pneumatic dilation, uh, 
a group in Europe was actually able to do a randomized controlled trial comparing the POEM procedure on the left, where I showed you the endoscope is in the, in the wall of the esophagus, which with the Heller's myotomy, which you see in image B, which the surgical uh, field is able to expose the wall of the esophagus to simply perform the myotomy that way. Again, this was a multi-center prospective randomized trial. Uh, it was a non-inferiority study and 221 patients were randomized to either the POEM or the laparoscopic Hellers. Different with this trial though, is they did perform something called a door fundoplication. And the reason is that patients that undergo POEM sometimes have reflux as a issue. You can imagine if you cut the lower esophageal sphincter, um, not only does it cause, uh, does it result in the pathophysiology of POEM, but it also provides some sort of protection from reflux and acid in the stomach coming back up into the esophagus. So that was an addition they did from the surgical side of things. Um, the primary endpoint was clinical success and the secondary endpoints were adverse events, quality of life, esophageal function, et cetera. Um, at two years, again, similar to the other study I presented, there was no difference between the two. Adverse events were slightly higher in the laparoscopic Heller's group, but on the other hand, there was more GERD in the POEM group. Um, generally, this is GERD that's very easily controlled with PPI, and uh, most patients that I have seen would much rather have a little bit of GERD than um, not be able to swallow. This is a slide from Dr. Vela at the uh, Mayo Clinic, which I borrowed, and I really like it because he breaks it down by type of achalasia. And not to get too granular here, except to show you that um, POEM seems to be good for all three types of achalasia. But pneumatic dilation really is best for type two, doesn't really work for type three. And Heller's myotomy, so similarly, um, is not that great for type three. So the POEM procedure really is now, in my opinion, the standard of care for all three types of achalasia, regardless of um, you know, what the actual esophageal physiology is with the contractions. So that's the POEM procedure. Um, and next I'll switch gears and talk to you about a different uh, pathology, gastroparesis, that also has a third space endoscopy procedure paired with it. And you'll see it's extremely similar to POEM and draws on the exact same concept. Um, but again, I think this is another issue perhaps even more so than achalasia that most internists encounter, regardless of specialty, very consistently um, and have a lot of difficulty to treat. We all know gastroparesis is very, very tough to, to take care of. So just quickly in the time I have left, um, gastroparesis is defined as delayed gastric emptying, more than 10% gastric retention at four hours. We commonly see it in diabetes, they can be idiopathic, structural, medication-induced, and also post-operative as well after certain surgeries. Um, important to note, it's not due to an actual mechanical obstruction. So if you have a tumor in your stomach where the stomach meets the first part of the intestine of the duodenum, that's not gastroparesis. That's a, a mechanical obstruction. So what are our treatments? Well, really nothing great. Dietary modification, glycemic control for patients that have diabetic gastroparesis. Um, we tell them to eat small, frequent meals. We try to get blood sugar under control. You know, antral contractility really shuts down when your blood sugar is very high. We try prokinetics, although there's a black box, black box warning on metoclopramide. No one really likes to use it because of that. Um, erythromycin does not work very well. Sometimes we try to get domperidone from Canada, again, which is a hassle and tough to do. So we really don't have great options from a medical perspective and certainly nothing long-term. Um, sometimes we try to put a stent in the pylorus, which is the end of the stomach where it meets the duodenum, just to try to open that area up because there's an idea that the spasm of the pylorus and the muscle there uh, is what's causing this problem. The stent migrates a lot of times and it's a pain to remove and find. And the last option is a surgical pyloroplasty which is a very invasive option and, and rarely ever done. So the third space endoscopy procedure, similar to the home procedure, except for gastroparesis, is called the G-POEM procedure. So it's easy to remember. You just stick a G in front of it. And, and it's exactly the same, except we're working in the stomach now instead of the esophagus. So 
what we do is we start gaining access to the wall of the stomach and we blow up this submucosal space with some blue dye and we burrow our way to the end of the stomach. And once we're there, we encounter the pylorus muscle. And that's what you see in image three. We're at the end of the stomach. This is the duodenum. And there's a muscle here called the pylorus, which we think acts in a similar way to the lower esophageal sphincter in achalasia in terms of causing a problem. And we just use a knife and we simply cut that muscle. And usually patients experience great relief in terms of food being able to pass. The incision is closed with clips and the procedure is done. These are the endoscopic images. This is the access to the uh, wall of the stomach. We inject some solution to create this big, safe bleb. And then we, uh, we have our blue dye and we kind of navigate our way through. So a panel B on the bottom is a muscle layer and, and on the top is a submucosa. And see, it's a subtle image, but this is the pylorus muscle right here that needs to be cut. And then above it is the duodenal mucosa on the other side. Um, and this is what it looks like when we've cut that muscle. Lastly, we put some clips in and um, it heals up like we were never there. So we don't have as much experience with this procedure as we do with the poem procedure. The largest series is 47 patients. Otherwise, um, you know, most centers have done, that do them high volume centers have done maybe 30 or 40 of these. Um, but clinical success does seem pretty good. You know, 80 to 90%, which for a disease that is notoriously difficult to treat, I think is quite an accomplishment. Um, follow up, so far we only have a year for most patients, but the ones I have seen that have you know, had this procedure a year ago, most of them are still doing quite well. Adverse events are low, and um, I'll show you a study. This is from the group probably with large experience in the States from Emory. Uh, this was 30 patients they did over the past several years, and uh, patients had a significantly increased SF36 or quality of life scores compared to before they had the procedure. They had reduction in nausea, vomiting, early satiety, bloating, um, and their actual gastric emptying study, which is what we used to diagnose gastroparesis, improved in 78% of patients and normalized in about half the group. What I think is even more impressive about this procedure though is this data which the same group also presents and really shows a dramatic decrease in the amount of healthcare utilization pre and post this g poem procedure. As you can see pretty dramatically, patients with gastroparesis tend to come to the ER and get admitted to the hospital very often, often several times per month. And then they, we don't have great treatments for them. We give them um, you know, IV prokinetics, hydration, and then they just get a little better and go home and they come back again in a few weeks. But after this procedure, at six months, that number is dramatically decreased compared to historic controls. And I think that is one of the real benefits of this procedure that hopefully will become more clear as we um, gain a little more experience of it. So in conclusion, third space endoscopy is a new technique that allows safe access to the deeper layers of the GI tract without the risk of perforation um, two applications are the POEM procedure for achalasia and the G POEM procedure for gastroparesis, which I discussed. And I think as these procedures evolve, the distinction between a therapeutic gastroenterologist and a minimally invasive surgeon uh, will very much continue to blur. Um, these are some pictures from my trip in October to Prague at EPEM uh, over there. This is Dr. Martinick, who is one author of the New Journal paper, and um, some live procedures I was able to do and receive some training over there. Uh, Dr. Soto is my partner and Dr. Pace, our Jay Lab Mobility Director and um, some press about how we're starting these programs over here. Um, so thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will uh, end it over. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for a beautiful presentation. Very clearly done, nice slides. Very interesting, learned a lot. Just two quick questions. One, in the gastroparesis patients that receive g -pomes, do we know that had diabetes? Do we know if there's been any uh, actual improvement in the brittleness of their diabetes? Uh, and has that improved the outcome in that regard? Um, you know, I don't know that we have data on that at this point uh, in terms of the brittleness of their diabetes. Um, there is a, actually where I was trained, there's an ongoing study 
looking at a G foam versus sham procedure. And it seems like the patients, uh, substratified in the patients that have gastroparesis and diabetes or post-surgical or idiopathic. And again, it seems like the ones that have diabetes seem to do very well with this procedure uh, from a purely a, a gastric uh, symptom type of perspective. And, and just one real silly question almost in a way, it would seem to me in the POEM procedure, you cut the whole muscle from the beginning to the end of the assault. Why don't you just cut a little bit by the, uh, where this, this the finger is? That's a very astute observation. And, uh, you know, that is the direction that we're moving in with this procedure. It was designed that way initially and it worked and people kept doing it. But as we're getting more experience, we're realizing that we can just cut a lower and lower and lower. And so that is the way this procedure is going to, to trend. Um, Dr. Gershon Gorn, you want to ask your question? Okay, sure. I just didn't know if there was time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Amin, for a presentation about something I knew nothing about, so I appreciate it. Um, your last slide said there's no risk of perforation, and that seems like a bold statement to me, and I'm just curious if you can explain, is that based on prior study, or is there something about this procedure that literally means there's no risk of perforation? Sure. You know, there's always going to be misadventures with any of these procedures, and so you're, maybe it is a little aggressive to say no risk of perforation, but the concept of the procedure is that we create this mucosal flap or mucosal entry site to gain access into the wall of the esophagus or the stomach. And at the end of the procedure, we close that shut with clips. And so it looks, so, so there's no way for um, fluid or any contamination to leak through from the lumen through the wall because we close that initial entry site. Despite all the things we're doing, it's just a two centimeter entry site that gains us access into the wall and we close that up. So that, that's the idea there. Any other questions? Please unmute yourself. Thank you again, Dr. Min, that was wonderful. We'll, be, we'll go on to our next vignette, Dr. Patel. Please introduce our next speaker. So our uh, second speaker today um, will be Dr. Efren Manjarez. Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Dr. Monjarez received his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of California, Irvine, after which time he received his Master of Arts from California State University. He then attended medical school at the University of California School of Medicine in San Diego. After graduating medical school, Dr. Manjarez completed his residency training in internal medicine and pediatrics at Jackson Memorial Hospital and the University of Miami School of Medicine. After completing his training, he has had many administrative roles, including that of Associate Chief Medical Officer of the University of Miami Hospital, Patient Safety Officer of the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, Chief of the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, and Associate Chief of Patient Safety and Quality Officer for U Health, to name a few. He recently received the 2020 Society of Hospital Medicine Award of Excellence for Outstanding Service. He has given over 100 national and regional lectures, and today he will be presenting on perioperative pulmonary pearls. Without further ado, I will hand over the floor to Dr. Efren Manjarez. Okay. Share screen. Uh, my screen's not being able to be shared. Shoot. Laura, can you help with that? Yes, you should be set now. Okay, can you hear me and see my slide? We can hear you, but we can't see your slide. Uh-oh. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Well, we see your laptop. Great. Are we good? Yep. Thank you. Great. Ed. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's always great to present at Grand Rounds. Uh, today, while I have no disclosures, uh, we're going to talk about perioperative pulmonary medicine. Uh, for those residents who rotate on MOD, of course, you're so used to focusing on the perioperative cardiac piece. 
So today we're going to talk about perioperative risks associated with obstructive sleep apnea. And then we're going to talk about, in general, perioperative pulmonary outcomes, uh, what are adverse risk predictors, and what are some of the things that we can do to decrease that risk. So I always start off and do presentations with a case. So you're a busy beaver at your hospital and you'd like to implement a standardized screening process for obstructive sleep apnea on all patients going to the operating room, since you know these patients have perioperative complications. So all of the following actually have a relatively high odds ratio or sensitivity for obstructive sleep apnea in surgical patients, except let's just say that the first four, all of them are correct since we don't have audience response. And let me tell you why. So this really begs the question of how can you make the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea at the bedside, whether you're sending a patient to the operating room or not. Um, so this is the stop bang score. It is uh, probably the most commonly used and most widely validated score uh, to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea without actually sleep studies. It consists of three symptoms. Do you snore? Are you sleepy during the daytime or take naps? Or do you choke at night? And then there's five other measures that are very easy to get from the medical record, blood pressure, BMI, age, neck size, and gender. Um, if that's not enough, then you can do a simple physical exam and you can classify the patient by their mal and patty score. The, and you simply obtain a mal and patty score by asking the patient to tilt their head back and uh, stick out their tongue. If you ask them to say, ah, it's gonna sort of falsify the score because when anesthesiologists are intubating patients, patients aren't saying ah because they're sedated and paralyzed. So when you look at how small that airway is, for example, the class four, the soft palate basically meets the tongue, that's a pretty severe uh, high score, mal and patty score with, with a significant risk for sleep apnea. So the stop bang score, each one of those, of those eight questions uh, is one point. And the odds ratio when you hit five points on the stop bang score is really high for moderate to severe sleep apnea. And that's the cutoff that's been used and published by Dr. Francis Chung, who's an anesthesiologist in Toronto who specializes in the management perioperatively of sleep apnea, and realistically the world expert. Sometimes you can simplify that score even a little bit easier. So if you're going through the stop bang score, and realistically remember that patients aren't necessarily going to tell you that they snore, it's going to be their spouse or whoever it is that sleeps next to them that you're going to ask you know, are they snoring? Are they fatigued during the daytime? Or are they choking? Because patients, of course, are asleep. So the stop bang score is zero to two. The risk is very, very low. If the stop bang score is five or above, then the risk is pretty high. And if they're going for the operating room, that's something that you need to be aware of. If the stop bang score is three or four, then you go to the next step, with, which is, do they have a score of two or above on the stop plus either being a male, a BMI greater than 35, or a neck circumference of 40 centimeters or 17 inches. And if so, then they've got also a high risk for having sleep apnea. Why does this matter? Well, the perioperative risk to patients with sleep apnea, that literature has just emerged over the last 10 years. Dr. Opperer has published this really large systematic review looking at multiple types of complications. You can see that the perioperative pulmonary complications such as pneumonia, uh, respiratory failure, COPD exacerbations is actually significant. Desaturating perioperatively and having a difficult intubation are also high risk in sleep apnea. When you look at the cardiac complications, really the most common one is perioperative atrial fibrillation. Thankfully, obstructive sleep apnea at this point in time is not associated with heart failure or acute MI perioperatively, nor is it associated with an increased mortality, but it is associated with a prolonged length of stay and using more resources. So what can you do for your patients? Identify these patients who are known sleep apnea and alert other members of the healthcare team whether they're known sleep apnea or you suspect them based on the mal and patty score 
and based on the stop bank score, put it in your medical record. If you have time, obtain their most recent sleep study results and recommend to the anesthesiologist or the care team what pressure settings they need perioperatively. And if possible, have the patients bring their device with them the day of surgery. And of course, uh, make sure everybody on the care team knows that these patients either have known diagnosed sleep apnea or they are at risk and high suspicion. And the other thing is to make sure that you optimize the other conditions that can impair cardiorespiratory function, such as other hypoventilation syndromes. The clue to this is that the serum bicarbonate level elevated is like the hemoglobin A1C in diabetics. If it's high, you know these people are having hypoventilation, they might not be ready for surgery. If they have severe pulmonary hypertension with right-sided pressures approaching 70, those patients really are not necessarily ready for surgery. And if they have hypoxemia that we don't otherwise know of the cause, those patients should be optimized before they go to non-urgent surgeries. Also plan for a difficult intubation and bag mass ventilation. If possible, use regional anesthesia uh, and use sedatives, particularly opioids and other sedating agents with caution because of course they can blunt the respiratory drive. Um, provide supplemental oxygen and uh, as much as possible until they can uh, actually saturate well on room air. The problem with sleep apnea is that these patients are oftentimes after general surgery, they're desaturating for 48 hours. And a lot of these patients come for same day procedures, whether it's an endoscopy or here at Bascom Palmer for eye surgeries. And so you can't watch these patients when they're here for ambulatory surgeries. Um, of course, try to maintain these patients in a non-supine position, wake them up, and then they can be extubated. And in the interim, of course, uh, monitor their, their pulse oximetry. So this is really the position paper from the Society of Anesthesia Sleep Medicine that Dr. Chung is the head of, uh, the lead author for. And of course, if need be, start them on their CPAP. Uh, uh, if they're known to have sleep apnea, of course, start them on CPAP. And if, if they're not known, but you suspect, of course, go ahead and start them on some CPAP. And again, avoid opioids or sedatives which blunt the respiratory drive. Okay, so now that we've covered sleep apnea, let's switch topics to uh, other pulmonary issues. So we have another case, a 76-year-old lady who's got right upper quantitative abdominal pain, looks like she's got acute cholecystitis. Uh, it sounds like she's also concurrently three days into a COPD exacerbation. She has a very poor functional capacity. She's only ambulating around the house and needs help with some of her, IA, her ADLs. And you can see she's got significant COPD by her pulmonary function studies. And she's on multiple medicines for COPD and she's an active smoker. On exam, she's wheezing in her lung fields and she's desaturated to 91% on room air. Her chest x-ray reassuringly is negative. So the question is, is which of the following are predictors of adverse perioperative pulmonary complications? And I'm gonna tell you that every single one of these is, and more, so let's discuss. So one of the things, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, is that we're very, very concerned perioperatively about cardiac patients. However, the respiratory complications are just as common that they don't get as much focus, uh, but they're just as common and they cost more than cardiac complications. As you can imagine, post-operative respiratory failure defined as the inability to extubate somebody within 48 hours or reintubation within 48 hours after surgery costs more money and it's actually a marker of very poor health. And so uh, the sad thing is, is that sometimes healthy patients also have post-operative pulmonary complications. Maybe they were difficult to arouse the anesthesia hit them very, very, very rough. And so the kicker on this and the teaching point is that when you're thinking about perioperative pulmonary complications, the most important thing to consider is where is the surgery? What is the surgical site? More so than the patient-related risk factors, according to a systematic review done by our colleague and friend, Dr. Jerry Smetana, Beth Israel Deaconess. So the most common patient-related risk factors are advanced age and American Society of Anesthesia score. Uh, but the most important risk factor is the surgical site. The closer and the larger the incision is to the diaphragm, 
the higher the risk of pulmonary complications. And so as a result of that, laparoscopic surgeries and lower abdominal surgeries, as opposed to upper abdominal or thoracic, have a lower risk of perioperative pulmonary complications. So here is a list of several risk factors that were found on Dr. Smetana's review. And you can see that a lot of these are abdominal and chest surgeries or the head and neck surgeries that are very close to the airway and can interrupt normal respiratory function along with emergency surgeries because emergency surgeries, sometimes patients are not optimized on their chronic medical disease. This is the Gupta Index, which was published a while ago on postoperative respiratory failure. And you're gonna see a theme. Of course, the type of surgery in the site, the anesthesia, the American Society of Anesthesia class, whether it's an emergency case, and the patient's preoperative functional status. How active or inactive is the patient? On the postoperative pneumonia, we can see smoking and COPD are also added to this, along with sepsis. This is the NISQIP, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, which is rapidly becoming the most commonly used surgical risk calculator for cardiac complications, sepsis, and pulmonary. The reason that this is an important risk predictor is because it's updated every month and for several years. And again, you're seeing the same themes, advanced age, general anesthesia, the, the type of surgical procedure, shortness of breath and COPD and functional capacity, and then these other diseases that have actually come up in the last few years as being risk factors. This is the Ariscott Index for all perioperative pulmonary complications by Canet and colleagues in Barcelona. They basically looked at over a year's time, they looked at all the patients in Catalonia, Spain, uh, about 6 million population, looking at non-cardiac surgery and taking a uh, risk derivation cohort and then a validation cohort with a very high receiver operator curve percentage. And again, the same themes, the age, oxygen desaturation. Here's one that we haven't talked about before, a respiratory infection in the last month. And of course, the location and duration of surgery. And so, they also have the Periscope Index specifically for postoperative respiratory failure. And the same sort of risk factors coming into play. Now, what about pulmonary function studies? Well, at this point in time, the current guidelines suggest using them for lung resection surgery. Recently, in the last year or so, there has been some data showing that cardiac surgery and TAVR patients have had some adverse outcomes predicted by PFTs. But I'm not so sure that that data is quite ready for game time yet, for, for prime time. So these patients with uh, using pulmonary function studies currently don't recommend that unless the above indication or unless the patient has a really poor functional capacity. What about frailty? Frailty's gotten a lot of play in the last few years. As people are now starting to identify and classify frailty. The Canadians started off with this, with the Canadian study on health aging, coming up with a frailty index. And I'm gonna show you a few of these. And you can see there are many of the diseases that all of us are taking care of every single day of our careers. And so as you add up those scores, it's been shown that in major joint arthroplasty, in trauma surgeries, and now lower abdominal surgeries, that frailty in the elderly has a significant odds ratio for having perioperative pulmonary complications shown there. So we are at the last case. Um, you are with grandpa who's having hip replacement surgery in four weeks, and he's known to have moderate to severe COPD and he needs help getting in the bathroom. He's got dyspnea and exertion after 100 feet and because of his hip pain, he's developed moderate anorexia, losing weight, and sarcopenia. Which of the following would be good ideas to reduce his risk of perioperative pulmonary complications? Well, although they all sound interesting, staying in bed, not blowing out the candles, I'm going to say to tune up his COPD. So the most important thing that we can do aside from tuning up patients from their chronic medical disease is perioperative lung expansion.
Now, Dr. Smetana in this review, a systematic review, pointed out to post-operative lung expansion modalities. He also talks about perioperative nasogastric tube use for patients who have abdominal distension. But I'm also going to share with you now some uh, preoperative strategies. So lung expansion comes in multiple flavors, right? We have incentive spirometers on just about every bedside in the hospital. And realistically, as a hospitalist, that's my go-to modality, first and foremost. But there's also deep breathing exercises that can be done with pulmonary rehab. And of course, our content experts, our pulmonologists, are really the experts in, in showing our patients how to do these. As needed, intermittent positive pressure ventilation and, and of course, uh, CPAP as needed. But again, the most important thing is opening up those lungs. When uh, abdominal distension is the issue for preventing, of course, things like aspiration, NG tubes should be cautiously used. The thoracic epidural analgesia is important for those patients that you're trying to avoid opioids in those patients with poor pulmonary reserve. And of course, smoking cessation. Smoking cessation is and has always been uh, an important recommendation, even though the data on that has not been as strong. Uh, Preoperative lung expansion for at least two weeks has really uh, been proven in non-cardiac surgeries to be effective. Now, let's talk about frailty, and let me introduce a term to all of you called prehabilitation. Prehabilitation is using a multimodal regimen to target those patients who are frail who now have been shown to have adverse pulmonary outcomes particularly in cardiac surgery patients and upper abdominal surgery patients. Um, multimodal therapies, and the most important thing is targeting these different areas. Nutritional stabilization with protein-rich meals, not margaritas. Pulmonary optimization with incentive spirometry and inspiratory muscle strengthening. Now, as I mentioned, you know, as a hospitalist, we of course use in the hospital, as soon as we get them, we use incentive spirometers. But there's also other devices that give sort of resistance for inspiratory and expiratory uh, muscle uh, strengthening. And our pulmonologists are content experts in that. I know we use something called an acapella device, which is one of those, but that's really more for moving secretions, uh, maybe more so uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, strengthening the muscles, although probably for both. Smoking cessation, and of course, you know, this has been showing some early, uh, early results in terms of shortening the length of stay of these patients who are frail and reducing their uh, perioperative pulmonary outcomes. So as we come to our conclusion at the end point, as we're talking about obstructive sleep apnea, it's very important to identify those patients. Something close to 25 to 50% of surgical patients who come in closer to 25% are undiagnosed sleep apnea patients. And they're at risk, at risk for perioperative pulmonary outcomes. And so it's important to let the anesthesiologist and the care team know whether the patient has sleep apnea, whether they're currently on positive airway pressure or they're non-adherent. And if they don't have that and you suspect sleep apnea, document in your notes the stop bang score and the malin Patti score and the serum bicarbonate level of your concern and anything that's related to pulmonary function. Obstructive sleep apnea precautions, as I mentioned, you know, these patients, they are put up in a non-supine position when they're waking up, they are awakened fully, and then they're extubated uh, once they're able to guard their airway. And we have to be very careful about referring patients who have obstructive sleep apnea for outpatient surgery under general anesthesia, as those patients can desaturate up to 48 hours after surgery. We want to minimize the opioid use, and of course, oxygenation and pulse oximetry, uh, oximetry until the patient's back to their baseline and using positive airway support as we need to. For perioperative pulmonary risk stratification, of course, you want to identify all those patients. And as we mentioned, all of these are significant risk factors that we need to address preoperatively if it's elective surgery or optimize as quick as possible and document in our notes so that anesthesiologists are aware, so that we reduce the risk of perioperative pulmonary complications and postoperative respiratory failure. And lastly, use lung expansion. And now the current thinking is multimodal bundles for those patients who are frail and have a poor pulmonary reserve. 
with exercise, high protein nutrition, and of course, respiratory muscle strengthening. And that's it for me, and I'm happy to take your questions. Hopefully, I'm within my time frame. Dr. Manharis, thank you for a very clear and uh, useful Grand Rounds. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I want to comment also, it shouldn't go without acknowledging the fact that you were just told about your ability, uh, your request to uh, do this Grand Rounds yesterday. And so on 24 hours notice, you must have a, an amazing repertoire of, uh, of lectures to give. Uh, the reason was is that one of our colleagues is ill with COVID who was uh, scheduled to give today's Grand Round. So not only was this a stellar stand-in, it was uh, a, a thank you very much for doing this for the department. I want to remind everybody to look in the chat for the link for obtaining CME credit and MOC credit before you leave. And I uh, recommend everybody read some of the comments in the chat. Dr. Marcus, do you just want to comment on your question? And then we can have Dr. Chediak briefly uh, state a, a response. And uh, Dr. Manharis to, to comment on that. Aaron, can you unmute yourself? I don't know if you can. Maybe Dr. Chediak, you can summarize Dr. Marcus's question with your response, and then we can have Dr. Manharis respond. Yeah, her, her question relates to the cost of diagnosing and then later adjusting PAP therapy for patients with obstructive sleep apnea, particularly at Jackson, where many of our, our patients are not covered by health plans or not covered sufficiently to afford these things. And my response was that, um, that in, in well-selected high-risk patients for moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, home sleep apnea testing can establish the diagnosis with great accuracy and you can have confidence in it. And it also establishes a degree of hypoxemia. Um, those patients can be treated with self-adjusting or automatic positive airway pressure therapy quite efficiently. And the, the devices are quite slick these days. Uh, the, the modern um, automatic positive airway pressure therapy devices record on a day-by-day -day basis or in a summary manner, they can provide you information on how well the patient's using the treatment how much leak is in the system, how much sleep apnea is left, et cetera, et cetera. So you can basically set the machine open and let it make all the decisions and it does a reasonably good job when compared to polysomnography uh, uh, adjusted CPAP therapy. If you have a patient in the hospital, which is really my point, because this is where the, the hospitals and the general medicine uh, team is more likely to, to find itself, is that the patient's already in the hospital, you're not really sure if they, if they have sleep apnea or not, or they do, and you're not really sure how to treat them, those same automatic positive airway pressure treatment devices can be used to, to uh, treat them without having to estimate how much pressure they need. In fact, I think they're pr preferable because if you have a fixed pressure machine and your pressure requirements go up because of opiates or sedatives or a tube in your nose, et cetera, the automatic devices will self-adjust and compensate to some extent for it. Now, having said that, it has been tried. Patients with a suspected sleep apnea, APAP therapy pre-surgically, didn't seem to change the outcome very much. Now, whether the, the group was the higher risk group or not, it didn't seem to change the outcome even when they had moderate to severe sleep apnea. Dr. Manharas, you wanna comment on practically how you deal with this, especially with our, in our patients at Jackson, which was Dr. Marcus's, one of her points of her question is the difficulty in getting uh, Jackson to pay for sleep studies or the patients who are underinsured it's absolutely true. We see the same thing at University of Miami Hospital, uh, that if we don't have patients who are funded, you know, sometimes the best thing you can try to do is at the very least get them some oxygen, but even still it's difficult. And it really limits the, the quality of care that we give to patients as we discharge them home, whether you're having surgery or not. So I agree with Dr. Marcus 100%. I agree with her 100%. And she and I can talk offline about how we can talk to Jackson about this, along with Dr. Chediak. Um, regarding the automatic positive airway pressure, absolutely, it's, it's a great thing. I don't know, um, I, I haven't had the opportunity to use it very much myself at UM Hospital, but obviously, you know, this is, it's, a, it's a great modality. Well, thank you all. I want to remind everyone that Thursday evening at 6.30, we have uh, fireside chat, vaccines, and other things we can talk about, and whatever else is on your mind.
uh, you'll be sent a link for that uh, impromptu faculty meeting if you have any questions. It's not necessary to attend, but you're welcome to and ask any questions that you have. In the meantime, stay safe, be healthy, and uh, it's good to see everybody back after the new year. Take care.